Good afternoon, my name is Marco Greco. I work in the Nickel uh, development team for Couchbase. Uh, although most of the Nickel team is based in Mountain View, uh, California, I'm actually based in London. Not even Manchester, so it's just me, which is a bit lonely. Anyway, so today, as, we, as I said, we're going to talk about Nickel, and I will spare you that. But the long and the short of it is that SQL has made such inroads over 30 plus years um, in the database world that um, possibly after the start of the NoSQL movement, there might be a reason to start doing SQL type sort of languages on top of NoSQL. Um, NoSQL uh, being used in a sort of a loose way, so from document stores to um, big data and all that kind of stuff. So that's precisely what we're going to cover. Um, reason death for uh, SQL. Oh, shouldn't have tried the French, shouldn't I? Um, NoSQL ascent, what we're looking for in SQL type languages for NoSQL, and then some nickel. I'll spare you the definition, but what SQL does is managing and querying data held in a relational database engine. And this is done on the basis of um, relation algebra, tuple calculus, and in three parts. Data definition, you want to know what your data looks like. Data manipulation, um, data as history and data control language. So as we said, based on the relational data model, uh, it's declarative, and that's important. We'll get back to this. Essentially, you're not saying how to get data. You're saying what data to get, which is substantially different. And um, has got moderately few primitives querying uh, DML, um, and then there's, there should be alter as well, so um, data definition as well. Arithmetic operators, logicals, some set operators, and it's got uh, native data types, which in time actually got extended to uh, user-defined. And key part of uh, SQL is schema design and management have major business, major impact on business applications. Features. Well, transactions, um, realistically, they are not part of the language definition itself, but due to relational algebra, you can't really get away with building applications unless you have got transactions. Um, over 30 years, there has been an awful lot of... Uh, work on feature um, on top of the language uh, as such. So, for instance, named and anonymous statement blocks uh, in the form of store procedure, in the form of um, client communication protocols, in the form of triggers. Uh, optimizers have moved from being purely rule-based to um, cost-based and there has been even some research work on self-learning optimizers, um, which sometimes actually do get it wrong. It has spawned a whole bunch of um, related languages. Um, I think 4GL um, here um, is named just because the, uh, the writer of these slides has a 4GL past. And it's been extended um, in quite a number of times, most notably with the whole OOP SQL um, sort of movement with Postgres and Illustra and things like that. But, you know, um, there have been um, spatial search extenders, text extenders, uh, queues, sets, um, you name them. So why no SQL? I'll, uh, I will not bore you with this, but um, the long and the short of it is that um, 
relational database engines have got two major limitations. One is schema inflexibility. And in actual fact, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to have schemas that change without impacting the actual running of the application. Um, and then the other major thing is scalability. Typically with things like Oracle, you get up to a point and then you can go uh, any further. The only way to, uh, to do is go to Oracle, say, give me a bigger sandbox, and they'll say, that'll be $5 billion, thank you very much. Um, which is not um, a good way to actually run your business. Well, Sun might be happy, or Oracle might be happy with that, but probably not you. Um, and essentially, we also try and exploit specific um, patterns in the data to improve performance and um, have a whole bunch of features to uh, um, improve um, availability through replication, failover, and other mechanisms. So if we have a look at what data looks like, essentially um, it has got an awful lot of structure. It's got attributes. Uh, it's got substructure, as in a person is not just a person, but um, it has got credit cards, contacts, um, buys stuff, um, house houses, and all that kind of stuff. In the relational world, um, you represent that through an operation called normalization. So you take your data, um, take homogeneous um, sets, and split them and stick them in an entity called a table. And you keep on doing that until you can split no more. That gives you structure, but then the issue is that once you start querying and once you start um, manipulating data, you have to do an awful lot of um, assembly and disassembly. And that, that takes time, and that um, has got a whole bunch of other considerations along the lines of you want to be sure that the data um, or the set of data is, is modified in a consistent manner, in an atomic manner, and because um, otherwise, uh, essentially, your data loses value. There are two characteristics here. One is value evolution, so things change, as, as Stephanie this morning um, buys another thing. Uh, you want to insert new data. And um, the structure actually um, evolves. Um, at some stage, um, there will be um, uh, a nice new communication protocol that the telco companies will be wanting to sell you. And all of a sudden, you know, you're not just building 3G, not 4G. There will be 5G. And um, you have to change your tables to actually reflect that. Otherwise, you're not going to build your customers. On the contrary, JSON um, basically is um, <coughs> quite rich in the way it represents data because it is hierarchical. I mean, it, it starts as a um, data uh, exchange format. That is precisely what it is. But um, it has got one... Um, really nice feature, which is if you can use it to exchange data, you can use it to represent data, you can use it to actually query data, which is uh, which has been used quite um, extensively by the whole NoSQL movement. Um, it looks like um, a set of key value pairs um, where a value has got a type, and the type, the type can be basic or it can be composite, as in you can have sub- uh, objects, you can have um, arrays. So that is how the two things map. And if you're actually using uh, JSON to uh, move data from a relational engine to another relational engine, what you have to do is um, assemble, move, disassemble, um, which makes it a bit complicated. So uh, if we're having a look at ways to represent um, data, and compare relational model to the um, uh, JSON document model. We've got on the one side flat tables, um, 
versus documents, you have, as we said, to assemble, disassemble stuff as you're going along. Um, the relationships are represented uh, either um, through actual explicit um, um, relational entities or just because um, the document is hierarchical. Query, well, uh, we are at SQL. For JSON, you so far have had to do stuff by hand. It's, um, well, uh, it's sort of like the NoSQL movement has gone all the way back to CISM, albeit with CISM being nicely sharded and able to scale up and um, have replicates and, and all that kind of stuff. Value evolution, yeah, you can change stuff. Um, structure evolution, on the one side, you've got fixed tables. You want to change something, you have to change the table. On the other side, you don't have to change anything. If you want documents that look in a different way, all you have to do is put documents that look in a different way, and that's about it. So a quick look at the uh, NoSQL engines um, in the market. You start from a key value store. Um, essentially, this is as low as it gets. It's a dictionary. You've got a key. You get a value. Um, the value may have meaning, but it has meaning to you. The key value store doesn't have a clue. Um, document stores are one um, level up. Um, the value is now a document, and it does have a meaning and other representation. So you can do, or in principle, the engine could do stuff with it, um, even without um, a query language. I mean, for instance, Couchbase does offer a sub-document API. Um, so at the key value store, you can actually have modifications of the document. Then we've got wide column like Cassandra. Um, this is essentially um, object-oriented database engines, relational database engines, stripped of joins. So you do have a schema. The schema has a meaning. Um, what happens is that you're storing everything in one place um, and you are storing tables in such a way to support queries. And if you want to do different queries, then what you have to have is another table with similar set of data, but uh, not exactly the same, to support the slightly different query. And then you've got graph, which essentially is a rehash um, of the old reticulum um, uh, model. So why do we want to do SQL for NoSQL? Well, these are the sort of uh, use cases that you will find in an application. You've got your typical OLTP. You've got your typical um, operational query. Um, you've got your typical operational search. You, you know exactly what you're looking for, but you don't know where it is. And then you start um, having a look at data mining, uh, OLTP, and ETL sort of stuff. With SQL, this happens all nicely through a single language. So all you have to do is declare what you want to do, and it happens. So far with NoSQL, this has been slightly different. You have APIs. Uh, you can do key value, get, and set, and um, a limited number of other things. And really, it would be nice if you could do the same sort of stuff that you do with SQL, but with NoSQL. So remember, bang in the middle, we had a nice circle with SQL. Um, once you start having JSON documents, things look a bit different. You've got a little API. And then you have to put your data logic in your application in order to get the result document out. So if we have this example where you want to find customers with orders greater than $10,000, you have to load all the customers from the database for each um, customer, then find all the, object, uh, all the um, uh, orders start totting up the totals for each order, uh, start totting up the totals 
for all the orders. As soon as you get to $10,000, you take the customer away and store it in some temp uh, temporary storage. And then at the end of it, you do um, some final filtering, sorting, whatever. You have to guide it yourself. As I said, this is CIism in a shadowed way. So what do we want to do? We want to have flexible schema. Um, we cannot rely on a predefined schema just because we haven't got it. All we have is documents which are self-describing. And the issue with that is that columns um, and data types are not guaranteed to be consistent. Something might be an integer in one document, it might be a string in another, it might be missing in yet another. So you need to have flexible data comparison. Objects are nested, so um, you need uh, a way to drill down. And um, you have to be able to work with a distributed data store. Um, that's easy if you uh, essentially abstract yourself from the data store itself. And then, um, with luck, you have to be able to um, come up with some optimizations. So there has been a bit of work on JSON from the existing relational world. Um, the slight difference is that JSON most of the time is actually considered to be a type, not storage. So if you're lucky, you might be able to do some cross-type querying, but where you can do it, that essentially entails extracting stuff from the JSON doing whatever filtering and sorting and joining you need to do, and then putting the stuff together. The interesting thing is actually to do things the other way around, where JSON is your storage, and you do the querying stuff strikes under JSON, which is nickel. Isn't that great? So we're going to cover a bit of nickel now. And the approach. You remember we had that. We want to change it with that. And now we're going to do it. If you remember our previous slides about the considerations, we essentially want to map that in, in such a way that we can do the same sort of SQL stuff, but on JSONs. So in terms of flexible schema, we have to interpret the JSON data. There's no two ways about that. We also need a four-value predicate logic. Um, the reason is that now a column, it's not just a value or null, as in I don't know what, the, what that value is or that value is undefined or it's not relevant or whatever. Now, since we have a flexible schema, a column might actually be missing, so we need to have a proper four-way four predicate logic. We have to deal with um, nested objects. So what happens is that now the key names become the column. And since we can have nested objects, what we need to do is we need to navigate um, all the way through the nested objects. And that we do with the dot notation um, C dot address dot zip, and in a similar way, we need to be able to address arrays, um, as in C dot find zero, um, and we need to have um, operators on nested objects. So you need to be able to actually join with subparts of your documents yourself, and to do that, we have uh, two operators, um, two join operators, nest and unnest. Uh, I'll spare you that, but yes, we want to do a powerful and expressive language which works for JSON rather than tuples. So if we start um, having a look at the select statement, it does look like a select statement, but now we can drill down uh, using the uh, um, 
some documents um, with the dots of notation, and bear in mind that names are actually case sensitive, and this is straight imported from the JSON standard. Um, we have the ability to flatten um, arrays and import them that back at the higher level with the nest operator. So essentially, we're drilling down order line items and referencing it as order line, and then we can start doing aggregation on order line. And we have a special reference to the actual document keys in order to implement the joins. Uh, the rest of it looks pretty normal, really. Other examples? Um, select just the same thing. The insert is um, slightly different in nickel than what uh, you're seeing here, but you get the gist of it. What we have to be able to do is we have to be able to specify the key as well as the value, because in document stores, the key is actually a separate entity, while in relational databases, um, the key is the primary key. It's actually a column in the database. The other interesting thing is that the select statement is composable. Um, since we are selecting from documents, um, there's n and selects do produce documents, there's nothing to stop us from actually doing using selects as the source for an outer select. Other stuff that you can do, this you would all expect, joins, subqueries, aggregation, you can combine results in whichever way you want, much as you do with um, SQL. But we've got some new things. Use keys, it's the way you use to actually directly access documents without doing index scans. The key in the use keys list is the actual key to the document. And this works nicely for um, hash dis distributed data stores, unlike relational engines, because we don't really have to have knowledge of stuff like um, <coughs> row IDs or node IDs or whatever. We don't really know what the key is beyond the fact that it has got a value, and it is really down to the data store to actually hash it in whichever way it wants, so that works nicely. And the other thing that you can do is a join on keys. On keys is uh, initially the first um, way to actually join uh, documents in, uh, um, in different buckets. The other thing that we have to have is um, a way of taking documents from a different bucket and somehow making it part of the outer document of the result set that we're doing. And um, we have to have a way to um, get sub-documents out of arrays, out of a uh, um, document, and kind of bubble them up on the outer um, projection list. And this, this is done with the nest and the nest operators, and they can be chained in, in whichever way. So on top of the expressions that we have in SQL, we have more stuff. So for instance, we can have um, conditions on whole collections. So you can say put a filter when where any of the sub-documents in the currently considered document satisfy some condition. Or you say that the, do the current document only gets considered in that particular case or when every sub-document satisfies that condition. And we can do also filtering. So we can get out of an array only those elements which satisfy a condition. So we can also do deep traversal, which uh, essentially means that we can drill down um, sub-document elements to find anything that satisfies a condition. And then set. That's actually a very interesting thing because we are now actually moving 
data definition language away from the language syntax itself and into the data manipulation. If you want something to disappear, if you want a field not to be there, you don't alter the document, you don't alter the bucket, you just basically unset it, and that's, and that's it. You can construct um, objects on the fly, um, so they are actual literals, and in, in general terms, when you are prepared statements, you can have uh, placeholders inside the actual literals, which is quite handy, actually. Um, and same thing for arrays, and as, as, uh, as we said, you can do a nested traversal to, uh, to any depth. And the last thing, this is key for um, flexible schema. We have the missing operator and the, the missing keyword, and that is the one way in which you decide if the document that you're having a look at is of the version that you want or not, or even the type that you want or not. The um, data types are the JSON data types. Um, there's no two ways about it. And um, we have to add a few things. Again, we have null keyword. Now, um, we have the missing data type to signify that, um, say, on a function, an argument is missing. Um, and we can also represent um, binary data. We also have special ways of handling um, data for two reasons. One, relational um, engines do have date or timestamp um, functions, and realistically, you need this kind of stuff um, to actually do serious business applications. And um, JSON doesn't have any date type. So um, we have introduced the millis type, and then there are functions to actually convert from string to millis and vice versa, and you can do um, proper date comparisons that way, um, which you couldn't do on dates unless you're actually using um, um, UTF format. Um, and then um, we need to have comparisons across all data type, uh, types, and the reason for that being a key that's coming your way is not guaranteed to be something. So if you've got two documents, um, where um, you've got an order and you've got, you know, the, uh, the cost of one particular item and in one, in one case it's stored as a string and in another case it's stored as a flight, you need to be able to, com to compare them to actually do a meaningful sort. So um, we do have well-defined um, comparisons for um, different types uh, for order by and um, logical operators. And uh, at the same time, we need to be able to have defined uh, semantic expressions um, for different data types because, again, you want to be able to sum two things irrespective of whether it's uh, millis and string or float and string and stuff like that. So that's the... Um, data um, modification statements, they all look pretty standard. The only thing that you should, uh, you should note is that insert actually has a key value expression, and that is because we have to, we have to be able to separate the key part um, from the value part, from the stuff that's coming from the values clause or the select clause. And the other interesting thing is that even though this is not actually um, in the slide, update and delete do have a report, uh, returning clause. You can get a set of keys that have been affected by the statement, if you um, so wish. So a few, um, a few examples of... Um, DML, as we said before, you can actually have JSON literals on the fly, uh, which is quite handy, or, uh, as I said before, even part of JSON literals with placeholders embedded. 
and we swiftly move on to indexing. This is the only part of um, DDL that we have. Um, you realistically rely on indices to determine what's the best query plan uh, to um, execute a query. And you have to create the indexes and drop the indexes. There are no two ways about it. Explain uh, is there for the very simple reason that if you didn't have indexes, everything would be um, a primary scan, which is not very um, efficient. And explain is the one statement that will tell you which indices you are actually using. Um, indices are fairly standard. Um, the interesting thing is that we do have array um, indexing. What does that mean? Recall that you have got sub-documents which are values to, to keys. If you're, if you're creating an index on that key, you are, um, or rather arrays, I should say, you are using the whole array as the value for the key for that particular index key. And if you then are looking for something that is part of the array, uh, that's, not going, that's not going to help you in any way, shape, or form. So with array indexing, what we can do is actually use each array element as index key, and then you can do things like where um, order uh, equals your order ID, and we will go through the uh, um, order sub-document in your customer document and find that particular um, order using the index, which is pretty nifty. Um, right, I'll spare you the obvious. Um, they're useful to speed, uh, speed up the queries. Well, yes. Uh, true enough. Um, the interesting thing is that you can actually create indices on um, any element of the document. So you can actually traverse sub-documents. And the other interesting thing that it's not in the slide is the fact that the create index statement can have a where clause. So you don't have to index the whole bucket. You can just index a subset of the bucket. And then the interesting thing is that the where clause in the index will be actually matched to the predicates in the where clause of your select statement. And that will be part of the process of sagging the index, so selecting the index for your particular plan, um, which makes it um, quite interesting. You've seen, you've seen this picture a whole bunch of times now. Um, it's getting boring there now. But yeah, that is what um, our client server setup looks like. You've got application servers on one side, nodes on the other. Uh, every node has got a cluster manager. Um, different nodes will have different um, <coughs> services running on them. You can have... Um, multi-dimensional scaling by which um, nodes will be dedicated to the data service, the query service, the indexing service, depending on what you need. There's nothing to stop you from mixing and matching services. Um, but yes, the long and the short of it is that the query service can sit um, in their own nodes. So um, if you need more query grants, all you have to do is kind of add a few query service nodes and off you go. Execution flow, oh, we have to play the nifty animation. So we've got our client, select, REST API, the query goes down. We pass it, we get all the expressions in the projection list, we get all the predicates in the work laws, we start looking for indices and drilling down expressions until we actually find that an index matches that particular uh, query path. 
we create a plan, and then we start asking for keys from the index service. Get the keys back, go to the data service, passing the keys and wanting the um, documents back. Once we have the documents, we can actually take them and start applying filters, um, clauses like limit, um, do the aggregation, and sorting and all that kind of stuff, and there you get the result back. The interesting thing is that an index could actually be the only thing you need to actually return the information. Say that all the columns in the index are all the expressions that are appearing in the projection list. Essentially, you don't need to go and get the document to um, return the results unless you've got um, clauses in the, uh, in the work laws which need filtering. If this is the case, we can skip completely five and six, and that makes actually the query much faster. Another pretty animation. The interesting thing is that we've got a pipeline, but several parts of the um, pipelines are actually implemented in parallel using Go routines. So what happens is that we pass serially, we plan serially, but then we start doing the scans in parallel, depending on the number of cores that we've got. Fetches in parallel as the scans are happening. Joins, filters, whatever, and then it's just the offset and limit that gets done um, in a serial manner. That's some of your connectors and a little summary. So we started with this. We want to obtain that, and that's done by a SQL, langu SQL type language which has been used in the field for 30 years um, and it uses skills that um, essentially all of the relation, uh, relational uh, practitioners do know but it's extended for JSON. Again a summary in terms of um, <coughs> features of SQL on relational database systems versus SQL on NoSQL, and um, I think the two things that really you should take away is the fact that you can do deep traversal and um, you have no mismatching error and you have got a fully flexible schema that's self-documenting. Um, in terms of everything else, we, um, you know, they match like for like, you have input in, in terms of tuples on, uh, on the um, SQL side, output in terms of tuple, and we do JSON and JSON. You can try it out. There's even a nice interactive tutorial based on ACE. You get your statement. You can execute it. You can change it and re-execute it again. And as for everything else, you can go to the cache base forums to, um, to get to us, Stack Overflow, and there's even somebody having a look at Twitter. So that is me done. Any questions? <laughs>